Can you hear me? Okay, make sure I have it turned on. All right, that's good. All right. It's nice to be here to be able to speak to you once again. And uh, for those that are watching online, I know there are some that are. I know that the Gerards are watching online. They're a little bit under the weather there, some of them, and we want to pray for them. Uh, all those that are also that are watching online via YouTube, we welcome you to our service today, as well as our congregants here in the sanctuary. We praise God for each and every one of you today. So it is good. So the text, Psalms 133, 1 to 3. It said, Behold how good and how pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. Thank you, Jacob, for reading that for us. Uh, it was much appreciated. Thank you for your uh, part in our service as well. So these are, when we read this text, this is a, a very comforting text, isn't it? It's comforting. And you just want to say, maybe, ah, oh, it's, it's, it's so, so nice, how, how beautiful it is to behold. And, and how we long for this in the times in which we live, in, in the perplexities and some of the anxieties that we experience from day to day. Uh, and we have those in our lives, don't we? We have some of those. So this message today, it kind of transitions a bit from the message I uh, spoke about uh, entitled The Harmonies of Heaven some weeks back. Maybe you remember that, that message. But as we consider the unity in heaven before Lucifer co commenced his work, we read the following, and, and we touched on this during Sabbath school today, this morning, was in our lesson as well, from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 35. And uh, Sister Dolvas touched on this as she presented the Sabbath school lesson this morning. <clears throat> it says, so long as all created beings acknowledge the allegiance of love, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. It was the joy of the heavenly host to fulfill the purpose of their creator. They delighted in reflecting his glory and showing forth his praise. And while love to God was supreme, love for one another was confiding and unselfish. There was no note of discord to mar the celestial harmonies. So we need to visualize this a little bit. There was a total focus upon the Creator in heaven, an allegiance of love to Him, and a delight to reflect His glory and to show His praise. There also was a precious harmony among the angels as well. In the universe, there was a confiding and unselfish love. So what do you think about the word confiding? What might that tell you? I think it suggests a certain sense of openness without the fear of reprisal. To be able to just say as you feel, and you know that the other person isn't going to misuse that. So then confiding and unselfish love is unity. Wouldn't you agree? So let's go to another example of similar unity, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the early Christian church in regard to unity. Their one desire was for the salvation of souls. Christ had ascended up to heaven. They were in the upper room. The tongues of fire came down. They were imbued with the Holy Spirit. They were to go out and to spread the word uh, of Jesus Christ is what they did. So their desire was the salvation of souls. They rejoiced in the sweetness of communion also with the saints. They were tender, thoughtful, self-denying, willing to make any sacrifice for the truth's sake. In their daily association with one another, they revealed the love that Christ enjoined upon them. By unselfish words and deeds, they strove to kindle this love in other hearts as well. 
Such I love the believers were ever to cherish. This is something you and I need to consider. This is perfection described here. Perfection. It is something we all want to be part of what the heart yearns for as Christians. So the quotes I have just read to you about heavenly harmonies and the early Christian church both continue with these words. But then a change came. We need these lessons on unity in Christ because we live on Satan's enchanted ground. He brought about this unity in heaven and the disunity on earth because he largely rules here. In manuscript releases number 15, it says that when God's people are born again, when they live the new life in Christ, with his love abiding in their hearts, their candlestick will stand in its place. But the principles they have followed in their connection with one another need revising. You see, we might be born again. We might have Jesus in our hearts. But the principles of our past relationships need revising. In their unity with one another and with God through Christ is their strength. Continuing in manuscript releases number 15, it says that Christ has specified the measure of love we are to show for one another. It says, a new commandment I give unto you, he declared, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye love one another. By this practical love seen by the world shall all men know that ye are my disciples. When the softening influence of the Spirit of God rules the heart of those who are connected with his service, they will honor him by keeping the new commandment. It's new because Christ said, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. The disciples never realized Christ's love for fallen man until they saw expressed on the cross of Calvary until he rose from the dead and proclaimed over the rent sepulcher of Joseph, I am the resurrection and the life. Lessons have been given in regard to this love, which are just as new to us as far as practice is concerned, as they were to the disciples before the death and resurrection of our Lord. When these lessons are brought into practical life, when God's people love one another as he requires them to do, there will be an entire change in the experiences of the churches. <clears throat> this is a very important quote. Learning the lessons of unity in Christ. Because Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. It was new to the disciples because they had not known the kind of love that Jesus had until they saw him going through Calvary, death, and the resurrection. Then they began to understand. Then the love that he commanded them to have became very clear. In early writings, page 88, Ellen White was asked the angel if there were none left. He bade me look in the opposite direction, and I saw a little company traveling a narrow pathway. All seemed to be firmly united, bound together by the truth, in bundles or companies. Said the angel, the third angel is binding or sealing them in bundles for the heavenly garner. This little company looked careworn, as if they had passed through severe trials and conflicts. 
And it appeared as if the sun had just risen from behind a cloud and shone upon their countenances, causing them to look triumphant as if their victories were nearly won. There are very few people on this narrow pathway. They are all in a single file. They're all experiencing things which perplex them, but they are bound together in bundles by the truth. In the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, it says this, I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down and none shall make them afraid. These are poor and afflicted people. They are lying down and feeding, but they have great perplexity. However, none can make them afraid. This is a characteristic of being a true follower of Jesus Christ. There is peace, and a lot of strife. How can that be? There is perfect trust, and there is anxiety and perplexity, so that these people are poor and afflicted. They are perfectly united because they are bound together by the truth. This little company looked careworn as if they had passed through severe trials and conflicts. Are we part of them, I wonder? What are we to do to be part of them? How come they are poor and afflicted? What is it that afflicts them? In the book of Zechariah, chapter 3, Verses 1 to 3. Zechariah 3, 1 to 3. It says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and stood before the angel. So now in Testimonies, Volume 5, five verse, I mean, uh, page 472, it says that Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with particular force to the experience of God's people and the closing up of the great day of atonement. The little company is poor and afflicted. Why? They are this way because the picture of Joshua and the angel applies to them. Continuing in volume five of the testimonies, the remnant church will be brought into great trial and distress. Those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will fear, feel the ire, which is the anger and the wrath of the dragon and his host. Who's the dragon? Satan's the dragon. Satan numbers the world as his subjects. He has gained control of the apostate churches. But here is a little company that are resisting his supremacy. 
If he could blot them from the earth, his triumph would be complete. So there's this little company. Are you and I among them? And being among them, we need to understand that Satan wants to blot them out from this planet. He has the majority on his side. This company is like a thorn in his eye. He wants to get rid of them. Have you experienced that yet? Sometimes we experience it in unexpected ways. If Satan can cause us to become completely distracted in our spiritual life, we will give up. That's what he wants. So what will he do? He will afflict us. That's what he's going to do. He is right at the angel's side, resisting the work of these people. He wants to blot them out. Continuing now in volume 5 of the Testimonies, same page, 472. As he influenced the heathen nations to destroy Israel, so in the near future he will stir up the wicked powers of earth to destroy the people of God. All will be required to render obedience to human edicts in violation of divine law. Those who will be true to God and to duty will be menaced, denounced, and proscribed. Proscribed kind of means both of those other two before it, menaced and denounced. They will be betrayed both by parents and brethren, I hope that doesn't happen here. And kinsfolk and friends. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be menaced. I would assume that you don't like it either. Maybe someone here has experienced that already in some way. How would you respond? Page 473 of Volume 5 of the Testimonies. It says that their only hope is in the mercy of God. Their only defense will be prayer. As Joshua was pleading before the angel, so the remnant church, with brokenness of heart and earnest faith, will plead for pardon and deliverance through Jesus their advocate. They are fully conscious of, of the sinfulness of their lives. They see their weakness and unworthiness. And as they look upon themselves, they are ready to despair. The tempter stands by to accuse them. As he stood by to resist Joshua, he points to their filthy garments, their defective characters, he presents their weakness and folly, their sins of ingratitude, their unlikeness to Christ, which has dishonored their Redeemer. We haven't quite experienced this yet, but we must be ready to meet this and understand what is happening when the time comes so that we will be able to learn to trust the Lord. Ellen White, in the book, Testimonies to Ministers, on page 475, unveils the work of Satan. And here it is. He says, we must cause distraction and division. We must destroy their anxiety for their own souls and lead them to criticize, to judge, and to accuse and condemn one another, and to cherish selfishness and enmity. For these sins, God banished us from his presence. 
and all who follow our example will meet a similar fate. There it is. As you see this happening, you know it is the devil causing it. If we have fallen for his traps here and there, we want to learn the lessons of unity to conquer and meet his attacks. Again, in Patriarchs and Prophets, in page 35, it says, but a change came over this happy state. There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted to his creatures. Sin originated with him who, next to Christ, had been most honored of God and was the highest in power and glory among the inhabitants of heaven. Lucifer, son of the morning, was the first of the covering cherubs, holy and undefiled. He stood in the presence of the great creator, and the ceaseless beams of glory and, shrouded, and shrouding the eternal God rested upon him. Satan failed to realize that the glory and, and, and brightness that he had came from God himself. It wasn't anything that he had in of himself. Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was thy covering. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. It says, little by little, Lucifer came to indulge the desire for self-exaltation. The scripture says, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Though all his glory was from God, this mighty angel came to regard it as pertaining to himself. Not content with his position, though honored above the heavenly host, he ventured to cover homage due alone to the Creator instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of all created beings. It was his endeavor to secure their service and loyalty to himself. And coveting the glory with which the infinite Father had invested in his Son, this prince of angels aspired to power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. Satan instigated this harmony among the angels of heaven. They had unity before, and then came a change and tries to destroy our unity as well. Acts of the Apostles says, but gradually a change came. The believers, referring back to the early Christian church now, began to look for defects in others. Dwelling upon mistakes, giving place to unkind criticism, they lost sight of the Savior and his love. They became more strict in regard to outward ceremonies, more particular about the theory than the practice of the faith. In their zeal to condemn others, they overlooked their own errors. They lost sight of the brotherly love that Christ had enjoined. And saddest of all, they were unconscious of their loss. 
That's why we need to study the subject a bit. This can sneak up on us, and maybe sometimes it has. Satan putting wedges between us. Continuing in Acts of the Apostles, they did not realize that happiness and joy were going out of their lives and that having shut the love of God out of their hearts, they would soon walk in darkness. Satan wants to blot us from the earth. If he can't because God is protecting us from evil and diseases, he will try to cause us to lose sight of Christ and become occupied with the do's and the don'ts we expect others to do or not to do. Our unity must be based on truth. Truth keeps us together, striving earnestly for the faith given to the saints. And as we do this, something else can happen. In early writings, page 258, it says, I saw a company who stood well-guarded and firm, giving no countenance to those who would unsettle the established faith of the body. Now, you and I may know the truth, and we might stand strong on Adventism, but we may not have the truth as it is in Jesus. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, 540. There will be some terrible falls by those who think they stand firm because they have the truth, but they have it not as it is in Jesus. Satan knows he can deter us from the truth as it is in Jesus, so he will try Oh, he cannot deter us from the truth as it is in Jesus, so he will try some other way. In the book entitled The Upward Look, on page 271, it says, By our unity, we are to bear strong, indisputable evidence that Christ came to this world to save sinners. Satan works with all his ingenuity to prevent human beings from bearing this evidence. He wants them to develop an unsanctified individuality so that they shall not love one another. Have you ever felt that way before? Well, just leave me alone, everybody. I want to have my relationship with Jesus. You spoil it for me. I just want to be on my own. Ever have this feeling creep in on you? I can't stand people, they annoy me. I will stand on my own. This is Satan at work. He wants to develop in us an unsanctified individuality so we don't love one another. Continuing in the upward look, too often professing Christians yield to him. And then the merest trifle causes a difference to spring up among them. Take a good look. What causes differences? Husband and wives in their homes? Trifles? Little things that grow into mountains, maybe? Satan is at work. Men and women professing godliness build walls of separation between them and their fellow workers because not all think exactly the same way or follow exactly the same methods. We see things slightly differently. And this will never disappear. But if we want unity and don't learn the lessons of unity in Christ, these differences will become a separating wall. <clears throat> That's Satan at work. <clears throat> Those who stand apart, refusing to harmonize, this God before the world. 
Christ, <clears throat> he prayed for unity. It is his, his will that his followers shall labor together in Christian fellowship. In Steps to Christ, page 71, it says, when the, mind's, when the mind dwells upon self, it is turned away from Christ, the source of strength and life. <clears throat> Hence, it is Satan's constant effort to keep the, the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ. The pleasures of the world, life's cares and perplexities and sorrows, <clears throat> the faults of others or your own faults and imperfections, to any and all of these, he will seek to divert the mind. Do not be misled by his de devices. Many who are really conscientious and who desire to live for God, he too often leads to dwell upon their own faults and weaknesses, and thus separating them from Christ, he hopes to gain the victory, you see. Let us not be deceived by his devices. <clears throat> In counsels to writers and editors, Pen of Inspiration says, we are to pray for divine enlightenment. But at the same time, we should be careful how we receive everything termed new light. We must beware lest under cover of searching for new truth, Satan shall divert our minds from Christ and the special truths for this time. She goes on to say, I have been shown that it is the device of the enemy to lead minds to dwell upon some obscure and unimportant point, <clears throat> something that is not fully revealed or is not essential for our salvation. This has made the absorbing theme or the present truth when all their investigations and suppositions only serve to make matters more obscure than before and to confuse the minds of some who ought to be seeking for oneness through sanctification of the truth. <clears throat> Becoming absorbed with some slant of truth or doctrine that is not necessary to promote because it is not an exact revelation is majoring in minors. It is Satan's trap, and we must beware. And then there are side issues. In manuscript releases, it says that the Lord will do a great work in the earth. Satan makes a determined effort to divide and scatter his people. He brings up side issues to divert minds from the important subjects which should engage our attention. Individually, we are to feel the importance of uniting in the firm bonds of Christian fellowship. With one heart and mind, we are to prepare for the conflict. With faith, laying our petitions before the mercy seat, the throne of God is arced by the bow of promise. And the prayers offered in simplicity and faith will be heard. It is God's glory to answer the supplications of his people. He loves to hear them. I have been instructed in regard to the danger of drawing apart. Let us leave to Satan and his angels, the, the, his agents, the cruel work of accusing and fault-finding. Our work is to repent before God, because if belief and want of love for him who died for us and for one another, the gold of love and faith is waiting in our ranks. Christ declares, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Satan determines to divide and scatter God's people. And so what might be some of the items of his strategy? Well, number one, we can say the faults of others. 
We all have some faults, don't we? Of course we do. We're not perfect. So there's plenty for the, for the evil one to feast on. How about life's cares and perplexities? Satan makes these very plentiful to us. He causes people to create perplexities to make these to be so important. How about our own faults and imperfections? Satan doesn't want us to see our sinfulness and run to Christ for help. He wants us to feel despondent when we see our sins and lose sight of Jesus. And then, perhaps there is majoring in minors. Making mountains out of little things that are not a life and death situation. In the book, Christ Triumphant, page 362, it says that workers should not feel that it is a virtue to stand apart because they do not see all minor points in exactly the same light. If they agree on fundamental truths, they should not differ in dispute about matters of little real importance. To dwell on perplexing questions that after all, all are of no vital consequence tends to call the mind away from truths that are vital to the saving of the soul. Manuscript releases says, and there shall be with the people of God the cropping out of, ev of the very same spirit which they have condemned in the denominations. Because there was a difference of understanding on some points but not vital questions. Shall the same spirit in any form be cherished among Seventh-day Adventists? The cooling of friendship, the withdrawal of confidence, the misrepresentation of motives, the endeavor to thwart and turn into ridicule those who honestly differ with them in their views? Have you ever found that? Someone in the church who differs from your views? Sure, perhaps some of us have. All this leads to the undermining of harmony and unity. A certain person becomes so big that pride of opinion and stubbornness shuts the soul away from God. Then this allows Satan to come in with his attacks. What shall we then do? We must meet this and adjust ourselves so that this does not deteriorate a precious union. In Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16, it says, Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, it says, But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This is the truth in love. It is every member of the body of God's people realizing that they have a, peculiar, a particular gift from the Lord that they will use and exercise in love for one another. Every member supplies something to make the body function sweetly. We can fall so easily off the track of building up each other in love. What was Jesus' prayer in John 17? I know you've read it before. That they, the church that is, may be one even as the Father and the Son are one. That's what he wants for his church. In closing, may God keep this very fresh in our minds, 
that those descriptions of the attacks of Satan are clear in our minds, but not to become paranoid by them. We don't need to become that way. And when we sense some estrangements happening to us, we can resist the evil one by prayer and by focusing only on Jesus. May this be our determination, brothers and sisters. God help us to focus diligently on Christ. Amen?